Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the PHI Atrial Fibrillation Virtual Grand Rounds. This is 2020, and we are still in the middle of a pandemic. So we are doing our best by staying uh, socially distant. Uh, we are wearing masks. Our camera crew is wearing masks. I hope all of you guys are staying safe, and uh, and you know we can continue this educational process even even during these times. So um, I'm Sandeep Goyal. I'm one of the electrophysiologists at uh, Piedmont Heart Institute. And with me, I have Dr. Michael Husian, who is uh, one of my partners and another electrophysiologist at Piedmont Heart Institute. We both have um, interest in taking care of patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, today, we would like to discuss uh, some common clinical questions uh, regarding atrial fibrillation and uh, also discuss some recent advances uh, and recent data that have come out in the last couple of years regarding management of patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, Michael. All right, so we're gonna start with a few cases here and um, Sandeep, I'd like you to uh, listen to the two cases and then walk us through why you would manage these two patients very differently. So case number one, uh, this is a 65 year old male, uh, no significant past medical history, uh, normal BMI. Um, he uh, presents to his PCP's office uh, with palpitations um, and is found to be in atrial fibrillation with rapid rates. Uh, he's back in sinus rhythm by the time he gets to the emergency room and is sent home. He has another episode of atrial fibrillation uh, several months later, which again uh, self-terminates, but this time after several hours. His echo is notable for uh, a normal uh, left ventricle and normal left atrial dimensions. So that's case number one. Uh, case number two, this is an 81-year-old 80, male. He has hypertension, he's diabetic, he's obese. Uh, he comes to his initial electrophysiology visit in rate-controlled atrial fibrillation. Uh, onset was five years ago, and he's been persistent for the last two years. Uh, his echo is not notable, again, for a normal left ventricle, uh, but moderate severe left atrial enlargement. So um, if you could just consider these two cases and uh, explain why you would manage them very differently. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's very interesting uh, when we think about these, these two patients, we, we say both of them have atrial fibrillation, right? But they're so different from each other. So let's talk a little bit about how is the atrial fibrillation is a heterogeneous disease. So how is it different? So, you know, we really need to think of atrial fibrillation as a chronic progressive disease rather than one entity. You know, I, I like this quote uh, which says, life doesn't stand still where there is no progress, there is disintegration. That's sort of what happens with atrial fibrillation. It's not, it's not stopped after diagnosis, it's continuously moving. And if we don't do things to, to prevent it from progressing, it will continue to get worse. So, you know, this is sort of the natural time course of atrial fibrillation. Uh, if left untreated, atrial fibrillation continues to get worse. It starts out as very paroxysmal episodes and then turns into sort of more persistent and then eventually it turns into permanent. Whether patients know about atrial fibrillation in paroxysmal stage or persistent stage depends on the symptomatology. You know, a lot of patients don't get diagnosed in paroxysmal state because they don't have palpitations. You know, it's interesting to look at the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation because, you know, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is really a trigger-driven disease versus persistent or permanent atrial fibrillation depends a lot more on the substrate. So if we look at this cartoon that shows um, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, it's being initiated inside these pulmonary veins. These are the four pulmonary veins our atrium has, and they really uh, drive the initial stage of atrial fibrillation. And if we then look at the, the electrical mapping of the heart that we have done in, uh, in a patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation by mapping the inside of their left atrium, you see it's all purple. And the purple in the, in the electrical mapping coding word means healthy tissue, and red means uh, sort of unhealthy tissue, and then there is uh, uh, the other colors of the spectrum are in between. So, so paroxysmal patients, they really don't have much atrial uh, scarring. Uh, versus if we move to sort of, a, you know, more persistent patients, they are different. How, how do people get to persistent? You know, if we look at, this is, a, this is a laboratory model of a mouse where they really pace the uh, mice at rapid rate. 
and then they develop atrial fibrillation. But early on, they convert back to normal rhythm very, very easily, just like the paroxysmal uh, patients do. But when they continue to rapidly pace the mice, which basically means they continue to see those pulmonary vein triggers coming in on a regular basis, the atrial fibrillation episodes tend to start, you know, uh, they, they stay for longer. And this is only 24 hours. Now, obviously, things move probably a little bit or a lot faster in mice than they do in, in humans. But, uh, and then if we look at uh, what happens after two weeks of constant bombardment by these triggers, the atrial fibrillation becomes sustained. And this is kind of the same process that happens in humans just over a much longer period of time. So how do these atria look once they have become sort of persistent atrial fibrillation? This is sort of an uh, electrical map of a patient with a persistent atrial fibrillation. And you see this has sort of some, some healthy tissue, but there is a lot of electrical scarring. This is sort of a very inhomogeneous uh, electrical substrate. And, and so if we think of our patients case one and case two, the case one, the younger, healthier, paroxysmal person looks like the, the example that I showed earlier. And our second 81-year-old would probably look like this or maybe sometimes even worse. And so, you know, how do we, how do we assess the electrical scar in patients? You know, there's been a lot of work that's been done on the MRI. We are not, we are not at the point where we could 100% absolutely assess it non-invasively, but MRI is our best modality. And if we look at different sort of MRI pictures and look at the progression of the scar, you know, you could see that the atrial fibrillation keeps on moving from a trigger dependent to a substrate dependent disease as time goes by. Um, so, you know, what are the some things that we can do to really halt the progression of the, the disease or slow the progression of the disease. I think we have to understand that atrial fibrillation is not, uh, a, you know, we can't cure it, but we can, we can make it better, we can slow the progression. And, you know, the risk factors are age, BMI, high BMI is worse, and then, you know, history of heart failure and things like that make, make it worse. And, um, you know, things that sort of help along with things is regular physical activity or, you know, history of early pulmonary vein isolation or early AF ablation. So among the modifiable risk factors, it's critically important that the patients lose weight, they regularly exercise, they reduce their alcohol intake. And those things kind of help sort of slow the, the disease progression. It's, it's very similar to how we think about our coronary artery disease patients. They gotta, we gotta manage their risk factors because the disease will continue to progress. And so, you know, that brings the question of, you know, what's the role of early rhythm control in atrial fibrillation? Michael, you wanna elaborate on that? Yeah, I think it's a, that's a very nice segue into, um, you know, whether we should consider early rhythm control in patients with AFib and also the reasoning why. Um, so if you could move the slide for me. So again, um, here's, uh, here's a case that we're gonna go over. Um, it's essentially the same uh, patient as um, I presented in case one for you, Sandeep. Uh, you can see the details here, but uh, in essence, this is the same kind of patient. Um, and so, you know, the, the typical or routine care approach for this kind of individual would be probably getting on a drug for rate control and then getting onto an anticoagulant if appropriate, and then probably getting referred either to cardiology or to electrophysiology once symptoms become more progressive. So this is um, the more routine kind of approach. So, um, you know, one fundamental question here is, why should we even bother? What is the purpose of getting patients into sinus rhythm? And I think there are two big reasons. Firstly, um, improvement in quality, quality of life scores. So this has been uh, true in multiple studies. Quality of life is better when patients are um, maintained in sinus rhythm. And this is also something we've seen in clinical practice. Uh, but there are additional reasons to try to get patients into sinus rhythm and keep them there. So uh, we know that, uh, when, when in sinus rhythm, there is uh, a reduced risk for stroke, reduced risk for clinical heart failure, uh, for myocardial infarction, uh, and for dementia. Okay, so clearly uh, it is beneficial to get into sinus rhythm and stay there if it's achievable. So if we go back and we look at some of the data, so this is a study called Rec uh, Record AF, uh, published in 2011. It was um, a, a registry trial. Um, uh, including a lot of patients, and clearly you can see uh, in sinus rhythm with, a, with an early uh, rhythm control approach, uh, 
reduced likelihood of cardiovascular death uh, in general, a reduced risk for stroke, and then also um, reduced risk for clinical heart failure. Again, just, just an observational um, perspective study, but still very uh, intriguing. So if you look at uh, how many patients are in sinus rhythm uh, at 12 months uh, after being observed in this trial, definitely much more likely to be in sinus rhythm with an early rhythm control approach versus just rate control. And then really um, critical to the topic that we are focusing on today is the progression to permanent atrial fibrillation. So with an early rhythm control approach, patients are uh, just fundamentally much less likely to progress from paroxysmal to persistent and then to per permanent atrial fibrillation. Uh, and as uh, Sandy pointed out, uh, the atrium really starts to change a lot uh, as we progress from paroxysmal all the way to permanent. And again, um, I think this is a really critical idea to emphasize here that uh, atrial fibrillation is a very heterogeneous disease. So in the true paroxysmal patients, um, it's really a trigger-driven arrhythmia. Uh, there is very little arrhythmogenic substrate at this initial stage um, of the disease process. Uh, then once we transition to persistent AFib, it is trigger uh, and substrate. So we have both elements, and it's the substrate that allows the AFib to perpetuate. Um, and then contrast this to long-standing persistent or permanent atrial fibrillation. It's really no longer um, truly trigger-driven. Uh, there is just a lot of arrhythmogenic substrate, a lot of fibrosis. The left atrium now has changed both structurally, molecularly, and electrophysiologically. Um, and at this point, management options become very, very limited. I think this is uh, a really important concept to highlight. So this, um, this is a, a very important study um, for us, and I think for everybody watching, this is the EAST trial. It was published this year, 2020, in the New England Journal. And um, again, this is looking at uh, prospectively early rhythm control in patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, a lot of patients, so over 2,000, um, relatively new diagnosis of AFib, and they were randomly assigned one-to-one -to, -one to either usual care, which I described previously a few slides ago, or to an early rhythm control approach. Um, so this is just how the trial was broken down. Again, um, a good number of patients. You can see that they are split pretty evenly between rhythm control and uh, rate, rate control or usual care. And there you can see um, the breakdown in terms of how many patients underwent ablation versus how many patients uh, received antiarrhythmic drugs. But uh, kind of throughout the trial, the majority of patients who were getting early rhythm control continued receiving it. Okay, and then just highlighting um, some of the important findings here. And this really resembles what we found with uh, Record AF back in 2011. So there is um, a lower likelihood of uh, cardiovascular death overall, reduced risk of stroke, um, and a reduced risk of clinical heart failure. Um, the event rates uh, were not very high in either group, uh, but these were all statistically significant. Okay, and then um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but these were the safety endpoints. Um, and really the takeaway point is that early rhythm control from a safety point of view was essentially equivalent to the usual care with the exception of a lower rate of stroke in the early rhythm control population. Okay, so um, again, just highlighting one more time um, the fact that early rhythm control, uh, we believe, is really useful for, for the patients we take care of because we can uh, dramatically slow or perhaps even avoid the progression from paroxysmal to permanent AFib. And this um, now is being uh, looked at in a more uh, rigorous way. This is the ATTEST trial. The purpose of the ATTEST trial is to see if there is a difference between catheter ablation and use of antiarrhythmic drugs in terms of progression of AFib. This study has not been published yet. Uh, this was presented at the European Society of Cardiology meeting this year. Uh, but clearly, preliminarily, the data suggests uh, a significant reduction in the rate of progression of AFib in the catheter ablation group, um, and uh, also concomitantly uh, demonstrating that patients are more likely to remain in sinus rhythm long term um, if they receive ablation versus antiarrhythmic drugs. So definitely a trial that's uh, going to be exciting to see once it's published. 
Okay, so just to um, summarize, um, again, why, why consider early rhythm control in atrial fibrillation? So certainly patients are more likely to uh, get into sinus rhythm and then maintain sinus rhythm. Uh, we will be able to reduce the risk of complications or co comorbid conditions associated with AFib utilizing an early rhythm control approach. And then again, um, critically important, this, this will allow slowing or perhaps even avoiding the, progr the progression to long-standing persistence or permanent AFib when we just don't have a lot of options to get these patients back in the sinus rhythm. So I think, uh, you know, that was a really nice summary of the, you know, recent data of early rhythm control, uh, Michael. Uh, how do you think, how do you think it, uh, it should affect the, the care of patients that we are, we are taking care of right now? Uh, what should we be thinking about? Well, I think, I think there are a number of different takeaway points. Firstly, you know, referring somebody with AFib, I think, um, is an important consideration. So I, I, I would say the, the initial presentation of atrial fibrillation should, should probably prompt referral to electrophysiology for a discussion about rhythm control. I think that's probably the most critical feature here. Um, and then the decision making in terms of early rhythm control also should be influenced by data that I just presented, namely, um, especially in the paroxysmal patients, we should be aggressive in pursuing rhythm control, whether that's uh, initiating antirhythmic drugs or considering catheter ablation. Um, but definitely in the paroxysmals, the sooner we start, the better they tend to do. I think that's probably the biggest takeaway points. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. It, the paradigm has really shifted even in, uh, you know, six, seven years of my practice. You know, uh, you know, over, you know, uh, we haven't really made a lot of advances in, um, in drug therapy. I think, uh, you know, dofetilide was the last drug that came out in 2000. But, uh, you know, the technology for catheter ablation has changed so much. You know, what used to take seven hours to do and, you know, two days of hospital stay has become a less than two hour outpatient procedure and with excellent safety rates. So I think that that's sort of, uh, you know, a big point that uh, our tools are improving where we can deliver better outcomes more safely. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I agree completely. Okay. So um, let me introduce a third patient here, Sandeep, and then you can discuss why this is somebody uh, that we would manage differently than the first two patients we talked about. So um, this is a 55-year-old female. Her past medical history is significant for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. She has atrial fibrillation and hypertension. She's had cardiac MRI done. Um, her ejection fraction is 40%. She does not have any scar in her ventricles. She has a mildly dilated left ventricle. And she presents in atrial fibrillation with controlled ventricular rates. So if you could just talk us through your thinking process managing this type of patient. Yes, yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting uh, regarding management of atrial fibrillation in patients who have systolic heart failure because we know that low ejection fraction is a big predictor of adverse outcome it, and it reduced longevity and overall uh, you know, decreased quality of life. So you know, I think before we talk about how I would manage, let's look at what we know, what's the current state of evidence uh, regarding management of these patients. You know, let's go back to, again, uh, you know, late uh, 90s, early 2000s, you know, the fertilide uh, uh, or ticosin, as a lot of us know about it, it was the one of the first drugs that was studied in patients with, uh, with AFib and um, uh, congestive heart failure, systolic heart failure. This is 1999 publication, Diamond CHF trial in New England Journal of Medicine, you know, and uh, it's, uh, it's basically use of dofetilide uh, in patients with, uh, with CHF. So what did we see? We saw that dofetilide is an excellent drug at uh, preventing atrial fibrillation, converting people to regular rhythm, or once they convert with cardio origin, keeping them in regular rhythm. If we look at uh, the graphs, they separate out immediately and they se stay separated out throughout the study, you know, over at least 30 months of follow-up. The unfortunate thing is though, when we look at mortality benefit, there's really no difference, you know, whether you treated people with rate control or you treated them with dofetilide, you did not see much improvement in mortality. And that, that's always been, been the case at that time. So then, uh, you know, we kind of move on to another trial that came in uh, 2008, again, a New England Journal publication. This is uh, part of the firm trial. We know, most of us know a firm trial. 
that was rate control versus rhythm control, but this was a subset which was basically patients who had heart failure. And uh, so, and this was an antiarrhythmic drug-based study. Amiodarone was the primary drug used. There was no ablation for atrial fibrillation that was used in this study. Now, atrial fibrillation and ablation was still in the early phases and the trial was probably designed even before, you know, it was, it was widely available. So, uh, uh, look at all these graphs, you know. Uh, there is really no difference uh, with antiarrhythmic drugs between, uh, you know, uh, cardiovascular hospitalization, cardiovascular death, overall mortality. There's really maybe a small signal of difference uh, in terms of uh, progression of heart failure, but not nothing really statistically significant whether we used antiarrhythmic drugs or we, we did rate control. So that has tempered sort of enthusiasm for rhythm control in atrial fibrillation patients who have systolic heart failure. Now sort of shifting gears and looking at this small but a cr critical study uh, that was done early on, uh, you know, it, again, I think this is a 2008 publication in New England Journal of Medicine. It's called a PABA-CHF study. What they did, they really took patients who had failed antiarrhythmic drugs, they had systolic heart failure, and they divided them into two groups. Uh, some underwent uh, pulmonary vein isolation, and the other actually underwent uh, a cardiac resynchronization therapy with AV node ablation. So how did their outcomes look? Now, this was not a mortality study. But if, we, but if we look at, uh, you know, improvement in ejection fraction, improvement in their six walk, minute walk time and quality of life, it was all better with AF ablation. Um, and then, you know, a more recent study from Australia, which is really, uh, you know, harnesses the power of MRI in these patients. So they, they look at the patients who have systolic heart failure, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and they do MRIs on all of these patients, and then they randomize them to either usual care, which is sort of medical rate control, or you know catheter ablation and rhythm control strategy. And uh, you know what they see is really interesting. So they see a significant difference in improvement of ejection fraction in patients who underwent catheter ablation versus who uh, just had medical rate control. And remember, all of the patients had medical rate control, so you know the ablation was on, on an add-on therapy. And they did pulmonary vein isolation, and they also did posterior wall isolation on these patients because all of these were persistent atrial fibrillation patients. So the question comes, well, who benefited most in this study? Did everybody get the same benefit? No. And that's where I think the power of this study comes. So they, the, the MRIs really looked at ventricular fibrosis. And what they found that if you had significant ventricular fibrosis, the amount of ejection fraction improvement you had continued to go down. So really t talks about that uh, the really sick ventricles did not benefit, but pa patients who did not have significant ventricular fibrosis had a significant benefit. And then this kind of led to a uh, CASEL AF trial, which is really our landmark trial uh, of uh, AFib management in patients with uh, heart failure. And, you know, they randomized about uh, 400 patients and divided them into two separate groups. Uh, one is catheter ablation, another one is, uh, you know, medical therapy. And if you see there, there is a significant uh, difference in both cardiovascular mortality, overall mortality, hospitalizations related to uh, cardiovascular conditions. You know, catheter ablation was so much superior to medical therapy in these patients. And, you know, this is sort of a little bit of a busy slide, but an interesting slide, again, to reinforce the same point that, uh, you know, patients who had LVEF that was less than 25%, they didn't do as well with catheter ablation as the ones who had EF or 25%. Patients, uh, you know, who had a lot of other risk factors, uncontrolled hypertension, diabetes, didn't do as well. So really, sickest ventricles don't do well, but everybody else does much better with catheter ablation. So, so I think it's really, uh, this data really highlights the, the fact that, um, you know, patients who have uh, congestive heart failure and have atrial fibrillation uh, need to be uh, looked at as a, as a unique set and they need to be further risk stratified. So, so this is a 55-year-old female, you know, she has non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, her EF is low, 
but she has no ventricular scar on the gadolinium enhancement, right? And she has persistent atrial fibrillation, you know. This is sort of our classic patient who uh, has the most evidence that they would benefit dramatically if we could restore sinus rhythm and maintain sinus rhythm in this patient. So, you know, in my mind, this patient should be treated with early catheter ablation. And some of these patients may need adjunctive antiarrhythmic therapy also, especially early on after catheter ablation. But eventually, most of these patients are able to come off of uh, antiarrhythmic drugs for several years and the rejection fraction normalizes. And most of them may not even need sort of ongoing, um, you know, uh, heart failure therapies. Versus, you know, if, if we think of the same patient and we change some of the things here, you know, we, we, we look at the MRI and we say the EF is 20% and 30% of this is late gadolinium enhancement and they've been in AFib for four years. You know, I think, yes, catheter ablation could be done on those patients, but the realistic chance that they're going to improve is much less. You know, that's really an advanced heart failure disease subset where they would need the best medical therapy and eventually uh, you know, they would benefit from, uh, you know, mechanical support or transplant. They're headed sort of that path. And catheter ablation is unlikely to sort of uh, roll that uh, that sort of, um, you know, uh, path back. And so, so really, I think understanding that, you know, that there is so much heterogeneity in these patients. And that's why I think an early evaluation by someone who is going to, who's going to think about this look at all the different risk factors and stratify these patients is really critically important and in, in sort of AF outcomes. AF is really sort of a hotbed of personalized medicine. We really have to look at every patient and figure out what is best therapy for them. Um, anything else that's uh, sort of uh, new? Well, uh, let me just say, I, I, I think that's uh, really useful, everything that you said. Um, and the, the point is that sinus rhythm we know is beneficial for most patients, but especially for this, this type of individual who has some degree of left ventricular dysfunction, uh, sinus rhythm is even more beneficial for this, for this kind of person. So I, I agree completely in the correct uh, setting and uh, selecting the right patients, uh, rhythm control here is probably going to change outcomes for somebody like this. Um, with, without um, uh, taking on a lot of risk also, including ablation. I'm just thinking, uh, what, what other questions, uh, interesting new things that, that people may want to know or, or other sort of clinically relevant questions we should discuss? So I think one, one important uh, thing to discuss um, as far as ablation is concerned, we've talked a little bit about patients that are good candidates and when we should really think about doing it. The other question is, who are the individuals? What are the circumstances um, in which ablation may not be something that we want to do? Yeah. So, so I think it's a, it's a very important question. And you know, I think we have to start thinking about atrial fibrillation as a, as a sort of disease process again, not, not necessarily uh, a single entity. And uh, as, as I talked about early on, uh, you know, there are patients who, are, uh, who have significant number of risk factors that are modifiable uh, that haven't been modified. So I think that, that group we need to really uh, take a closer look at before we offer them catheter ablation to see how can we optimize their risk factor profile before considering catheter ablation. And sometimes it's going to be possible. Sometimes we have to get them back in rhythm to really optimize the risk factors, but, but really need to look at those patients closely. So those patients are sort of, uh, you know, one of the big ones we, we, we see is really the, the patients whose BMI is over 40, right? And I think it's something that, uh, that the patient needs to understand that even if we did catheter ablation or, uh, you know, drug therapy or whatnot, they are, their disease is progressing very rapidly. And, uh, and unless we do something about, you know, the weight, unless we, we sort of uh, uh, help them lose weight, you know, and we have to do it in the, in the right way, which is that it's not patient's fault that they, uh, the obesity is also a disease condition. And we need to help patients with the right resources to get them uh, in a program so they can, they can lose weight. And sometimes, you know, in few patients, that program includes doing either catheter ablation or antiarrhythmic drug therapy because I think getting them back in rhythm 
they're feeling better, they are much more likely to be able to, to do physical activity. But for a lot of patients, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of some critical message we need to pass on to. The second is, you know, patients who have very bad obstructive sleep apnea, right? And again, they would respond very well to treatment, but they also need to modify their risk factors unless the patients understand and commit to modifying that risk factor. You know, we can only treat the problem that exists today with catheter ablation. We cannot prevent development of more abnormal atrial uh, electrical activity as much. And so, you know, really getting that commitment from the patient that they're gonna treat obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and you know, patients who are heavy alcohol use, I think you know, mild to moderate alcohol use is probably had some effect, but not as much. But patients who are, who are heavy alcohol use clearly uh, develop more atrial myopathy, and they really again need to make a commitment that they are going to to help us in that in that process. And and these patients are not immediately good candidates, but they can become good candidates once we have figured out how to control the risk factors. But then there's a whole uh, you know, host of other patients who are probably never going to be you know, great catheter ablation candidate. And that comes to patients, again, a lot of it is gonna come down to patients who have uh, you know, very uh, you know, fibrosed ventricles. So you know, patients who have had multiple MIs and have very li little living ventricular myocardium are probably not gonna do that great. You know. Patients who have severe, severe mitral regurgitation, you know, I think we can treat them, but again, they got a they got a trigger. That backwash of the mitral flow is just going to continue to irritate their left atrium, continue to make it dilated. So on those patients, we need to work with our surgical and transcatheter colleagues to address the mitral regurgitation, and then either they get a concomitant atrial fibrillation ablation during the surgery, or once the disease, that the trigger has been addressed, they have a catheter ablation or get medical therapy. Uh, but, but till we address that, that underlying problem, I don't think we will have a lot of, lot of success. And then, you know, there's a, there's a group of patients who, you know, patients who have, uh, you know, advanced kidney disease, they're not really good candidate for uh, you know, antiarrhythmic drug therapy. And those patients do well with catheter ablation if they're having paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. But if they have been left for a long period of time and they're untreated and they're long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, you know, our current tools may not deliver the best outcome today because I think we, we may have to, we, we don't have the luxury to, of using a lot of antiarrhythmic drugs as an adjunct on those patients. So I think those patients, we need to probably think harder, figure out, look at their overall health and risk profile and, and sort of pick and choose among those patients and not offer it to, to sort of everyone there. So those are kind of the things that I think about. Are there any, any ones other kind that, that you think about are not great candidates? No, no, I, I completely agree with, with all of that. Um, and then, like you were alluding to, I think the very long-standing persistent patient with, at with atrial fibrillation, uh, big left atrium, you know, clearly there is a very diseased substrate here, and I think catheter ablation could still be considered in these individuals. Um, with the understanding that the likelihood of success is going to be much, much lower than it would be for somebody with truly paroxysmal uh, AFib. And that's, that's a discussion that I think we all have um, with the patients, and then it really becomes a risk versus benefit uh, decision-making process. So yeah, I think modifiable risk factors play a big role, and then also what is the substrate really that we're dealing with. Yeah. No, I think that, that, that's great. I think one of the other things that often often you know, patients ask and you know, or colleagues ask, what happens to anticoagulation after catheter ablation? You know, let's talk about maybe uh, the current state and, 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 and what's future looking like. Right, I, I agree. That's, that's one of the, the most frequent qu questions that I get um, from patients and from other providers also. So the classic question, especially when we're talking about an ablation is, will this allow me to get off my anticoagulants in the long run? Um, and the reality is, at the moment, based on guidelines that we utilize to, to practice, um, the guidelines are very clear about this. Uh, if, if a patient merits being on an anticoagulant, they should continue on the anticoagulant post-ablation, uh, regardless of whether or not we document recurrence of atrial fibrillation. 
Um, so that's where the guidelines stand and, today. And, and we are using we are using Chad's VASC score as our that's as right. our guide, that's right? right? That's yeah. right. Yeah. So so for males, a Chad's VASC score of two or greater, and for females currently three or greater, um, they should be anticoagulated, uh, even with a successful ablation, uh, seemingly spending most of their time in sinus rhythm. This this is something that I think could change over the next several years. Now that we have the direct oral anticoagulants, we're not reliant on warfarin um, in every case anymore. And because the drugs have very quick onset of action, uh, it may be possible with continuous monitoring to utilize these drugs in a pill-in-the-pocket type of fashion or an on-demand uh, kind of approach. The idea being that if a patient has something like an Apple Watch or the Cardio Mobile platform, and is able to continuously assess their rhythm, uh, they would not take uh, direct oral anticoagulants unless uh, it's demonstrated that they have gone back into atrial fibrillation. Um, and the, the potential benefit of this approach would be much less time on anticoagulants, which then would result in lower risk of bleeding, which I think is something that a lot of patients, uh, even with the newer drugs, which have good bleeding profiles, I think a lot of patients remain concerned about that. Uh, but for the time being, Guidelines are very clear. We keep anticoagulating them if that's what the Chad's VAS score suggests we should be doing. And, and I think, you know, uh, one of the things that often gets uh, sort of misunderstood and overlooked is that immediate period after, you know, restoration of sinus rhythm, whether we do it with cardiovirgin, with catheter ablation, is actually the higher risk for stroke. So, so I think, uh, you know, I think it's important for people to understand that, you know, uh, we cannot stop anticoagulation uh, in at least for 60 days after uh, catheter ablation uh, for really any reason barring an emergency. You know, we should really defer everything elective till, till sort of the atrium has had a chance to heal and, uh, you know, the inflammation from ablation, whether we are using heat or cold, had subsided. And it's a very critical period, so when, when patients come back to the hospital, for other reasons, uh, I think it's it's important for people to think about that if they just had recently an atrial fibrillation ablation, they should really um, not stop the anticoagulation, discuss it with the electrophysiology team if there is a real urgent need to to stop anticoagulation. I think that's an important message both for patients and, and, and for sort of other practitioners. Uh, I think, Michael, we have a really good discussion about a lot of sort of important topics. I think, you know, when I, when I think of the take-home messages from, you know, reviewing the data, it's really that, you know, atrial fibrillation is a heterogeneous disease which has different stages to it. And, you know, earlier we managed the disease better, including risk factor control and rhythm control strategies. The progression of these patients to a worse disease is less likely to happen. And also, I think it's important to understand that, uh, you know, because there's such degree of uh, differences in these patients, there's so much role for individualization. Uh, all patients would benefit from a comprehensive evaluation, and that doesn't mean that they would need or would benefit from a certain therapy, but they would, they would be able to understand what their, their options are and what is the likelihood of certain treatment working versus not working. And I think at uh, Piedmont Heart now, we have a comprehensive atrial fibrillation clinic, and I know you are, you are driving that initiative. And I think, I think that's going to be a really good, good home for these patients because, you know, it's not just going to involve, uh, you know, physicians and or advanced practice provider, but, you know, we would be working very closely with our colleagues in nutrition, obesity medicine, sleep medicine, and you know women's health program and even even thinking of you know um, you know involving other community resources hopefully once the pandemic is under control of you know uh, meditation and things like that 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 you know really looking at a very holistic approach for management of patients with atrial fibrillation and obviously our advanced heart failure group is is growing and 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 we have really uh, you know uh, good uh, people who are thinking uh, in a very sort of a comprehensive manner about these patients. So I think, uh, you know, if you have patients who have atrial fibrillation and they need to be evaluated, uh, we are certainly happy to see them in, an, in our atrial fibrillation clinic. You know, the, the phone number for that clinic is uh, the main electrophysiology line, which is 404-605-2888.
and uh, and I think uh, these patients could really benefit from an early evaluation and treatment. So, you know, hopefully uh, you have enjoyed listening to some of this discussion, and uh, you know we'll, we appreciate any any feedback and uh, and thank you for your time and thank you, Michael. Yep, thank you, Sandeep.